Thank you, Martha. And thank all of you for turning out on an election night. I hope you all had a chance to vote, or not to vote as your conscience dictates. <laughs> so tonight I'm going to speak about Manchester 250 years ago. And to those of you who know this town, Manchester today is one of the wealthiest places in eastern Massachusetts. And as wealthy as Manchester is today, that is how poor Manchester was in 1772. So we're going to have to readjust our expectations. The history of Manchester is the history of a very small town and the sea. Manchester might have become an important place had it a harbor, but it did not have a harbor. And the harbor that Manchester has today is pretty much 80% a man-made proposition that appeared one day in 1893 when the high rollers dredged out the mud banks. So without a harbor, without a deep water harbor, Manchester had no future as a commercial seaport. And because of that, it remained a very, very small place. No one in the 1600s or 1700s wanted to move to Manchester because there really was no advantage to being in Manchester. So the original settler families who were given grants of land and their descendants stayed here and lived here happily. But unfortunately, they were not joined by others and they had to watch their bloodlines very, very carefully. At any rate, this uh, exhibit, it, this is not just a talk. We have a whole exhibit over at the Manchester Historical Museum on the topic of Manchester in 1772. We try to interpret the town in uh, a variety of ways. Most notably, the major business of the town in that time, which was the major business of coastal Massachusetts, the salt cod fishery. But there were many other slices of Manchester 250 years ago that are also quite interesting. And uh, we have a, an exhibit that if you put in the time, you perhaps will feel that you know something about this town and those people from long ago by the time you're done. Tonight, I'm going to talk primarily about the town's relation to the sea and the men and boys who were doing the seafaring. So, I will say this, that this enterprise began as a summer exhibit, and as we got into it, we realized that there were no material uh, relics relating to the salt cod fishery. That what we had was photographs, models, and other, other items that um, might recall visually this incredibly important business that sustained Massachusetts for 200 years, but that actually there were no relics of the seafaring and no relics of the processing of the fish, which was actually the biggest employer and we thought that it would be important for people coming to this exhibit to, to do something more than imagine from a print or a text what this was all about. So we were fortunate enough to reach out to the museum, the uh, museum in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, the Museum of the Atlantic Fisheries, which is run by Parks Canada. And it happened to be at just a moment where they were deaccessioning some of their extra <coughs> fish yard equipment. So by hook and by crook, we were able to acquire some 
authentic fish yard equipment, which is now on the grounds of your museum. And, and also to be fortunate enough to have the expertise of Jeff Parker, who built two beautiful reproduction fish flakes of the sort that was used in 1772. So if you come for a visit to the museum, and the museum is now open every day but Monday, so there are no excuses for not coming. <laughs> but if you do choose to come, you would find right around the corner from the street, from Union Street, a little fish yard that is a, a reproduction of a corner of one of these 1770s fish processing places that made the fortunes of all of Massachusetts. And you'd be looking at the only relics and the only reproductions of that incredible business anywhere in Massachusetts. So our, our exhibit began in July, and it took a break to make room for our art show. And it is now back in full force, what with the good weather, outdoors and indoors. And um, it is an exhibit at, at this point that has been filmed a couple of times. You can see it on our brand new website. And um, I will talk here about the exhibit with the thought that I'd like you to come. So I'm not going to give everything away. I'm going to be somewhat indirect. And you just have to forgive me for that. So outside, we have a fish yard. Inside, we have a series of panels that take a look at the town in various ways, seven or eight different ways in 1772, of looking at a town that was really a very small place. It, it had a, in 1772, it, its population was about 900. It had about 70 houses in the town, and no one here was well-to-do. So the, the thing that happened in Manchester in the 1760s and 1770s, as ambitious people cropped up, they found that their ambitions could not be sustained or fostered in Manchester. So many of them, thank you, Jeff. Many of them went off to Marblehead to make their fortunes. And, and indeed, several of them did make their fortunes in Marblehead. So Manchester remains this egalitarian society, one church, most people are in the same economic um, stratum. And the major employer of this little town that has about 100 men and boys who are working is the salt cod fishery. So here's the chief suspect found deep in the waters off Nova Scotia by the millions in those days. In those days, a codfish at maturity weighed between 100 and 120 pounds. It was a whole different animal and a whole different source of food. And that is what we're talking about. As it, as it turns out, and as you will see, cod was the only preservable, distributable, fast food of the 18th century. So this will give you an idea. Um, and that's, this is a later period after the cod has begun to be fished out. Obviously a kid from Newfoundland. And, um, and you see the size of the fish that we're talking about. So bear that in mind when we're talking about the salt cod fishery out of Manchester. These, these fish were extraordinary in many ways. They're, the properties by, of these fish, because it was not an oily fish, but a very meaty and steak-like fish. And if it were treated uh, properly, 
by those who caught it, it could be cured into an almost board-like stiffness after about three weeks, which made it possible for it to go months and months and months without spoiling as far away as northern Italy and deep into the Caribbean. And this fish, as shipped by the merchants of the time, made the fortunes of, of most of the great merchants of Boston. So when we look at Boston at this time, about 1770, most of Boston's fortunes are made on the export, the trading of this fish overseas for commodities that were worth a lot more when brought back here. But even at this moment, Boston is a town that has been invested by a British army. So let's not forget that, that in 1768, there is a, uh, an army of occupation in the capital of Massachusetts. And the people from Manchester had all paid a visit to Boston several times over to, to see this unusual sight of foreigners occupying our capital. And as you look at some of the vessels in the foreground, there are British naval vessels that are controlling the harbor of Boston in 1772. So we are, we're on the verge of something that's going to happen. We here in America have become relatively wealthy for a colonial pe people. And our wealth was something that the British wanted. And most of that wealth came one way or another from codfish. People didn't forget it when the United States was created and when our state house was built in an independent nation and a semi-independent commonwealth. Um, hanging over the chamber of our House of Representatives. Then, in 1795, when the State House was built, and today, is a five-foot model of a codfish, so that people did not forget where their prosperity came from. Prosperity did not come to Manchester for this reason. Here's a photograph taken before 1893 of the harbor at uh, probably mid-tide from um, above what is now Masconoma Park. And you can see it was a combination of salt marsh and clam flat and mud bank with a creek running through it, um, almost all the way out to Tuck's Point. So this, this was the limiting factor of the town of Manchester. It did not limit everyone, however. As I say, there were 100 men and boys working here, and almost all of them worked as either fishermen, meaning the catchers of fish, or as what was called a shoreman in those days, the men who helped, men and boys who helped to cure the fish. So that old Manchester that we were looking at, as you look at this map, that um, very first curl on your left, the blue water coming in, uh, this, there are no maps from the 1770s, so I'm using one from the 1850s. But all that other water in the harbor would be high tide water at um, mid-tide or lower tide. Really, the only harbor was, as you can see, where Tuck's Point is, um, hang a left towards what is a railroad track in this case, and that is Whittier's Cove. I don't know if any of you can think of it offhand. It's still there, but Whittier's Cove was the home of Samuel Forster's Wharf. 
And the Forster Wharf was the center of the cod fishery in this town. Sorry about the noise. Can people still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so essentially this was the harbor, Whittier's Cove. It was the only navigable safe place for a vessel. And Samuel Forster, a, uh, an ambitious young, in his 30s, Manchester man, had developed it as a shipping wharf for the salt cod fishery. And what you see here is part of a lithograph of Manchester, of that very wharf, as it had survived into the 1830s and 1840s. It did not protrude out into Whittier's Cove. It ran along the beach as a boardwalk. Um, and it was, it was made of pilings and stone. And I think it's safe to say that Manchester had completely lost track of the existence of Forster's Wharf until two or three years ago when I was down there doing some land use studies and stumbled on the remnants of this 18th century stone wharf. So it's still there. Um, so let me help you to orient yourselves to, to the place that I'm talking about. There's the rotunda and there's Whittier's Cove and the top of the water part here is where Forster's Wharf used to be. And this is where the fishing schooners were dispatched from. And this is where the um, salt houses were. And all of the land running up to Bridge Street was covered in fish flakes as a, as a fish yard. So let's hold on to your seats because we're going to take a ride. So if you look down and look closely along the waterfront, you'll see the corner a sto where stones make a corner. And then off to the left, they make another corner, not yet seen in uh, this. In this is all drone. But you see there, to the right, it makes a corner, and then some land sticks out, but then there's another corner. And it's quite a long stretch. It's about 200 feet. And this was all a wharf dedicated to the salt cod fishery. So here's a bigger view. That's the same place that we were just looking at from the air. And uh, we're looking at three or four different types of fishing schooner of the time. Tobacco boats are the light ones with the upturned pinky stern. And the one in the middle, the one that looks like a bus, is called a heel tapper, which was a, uh, a much larger, slower, but quite seaworthy vessel. And then you see another pinky built on a slightly larger model with that upturned stern that, that looks so unusual. But these, these vessels are, when they're out uh, on the fishing grounds, they're parked out there. And they're subject to the weather and to all kinds of large waves and cross rips. And having that upturned stern meant that, that it was much less likely that the deck would be swept by a large wave. It would, in fact, be split in half before it would sweep the deck. So pinkies were always around. So the business of the salt cod fishery begins with salt. And we didn't have any in those days. Salt, our salt, came entirely from Spain. As you can see, it's um, sort of large grain, coarse salt. And it was the essential ingredient in a world without refrigeration. So the typical small Manchester vessel and 
You might be thinking about Gloucester or even Marblehead and picturing a schooner, but in the 1770s, Manchester only had five or six fishing vessels. And the largest had a capacity of 44 tons. And the more typical sloop, such as this one, had a capacity of only about 20 tons. So these are very small vessels, um, little bigger than a pleasure yacht these days. They would take off from a place like Forster's Wharf laden with salt. So if it were a 20-ton capacity vessel, it would take off with perhaps 15 tons of Spanish salt in the hold, and the rest of it for the three or four fishermen would be a combination of beef in barrels and biscuit and rum, the essential ingredient for staying out on the banks for months at a time. And the banks that they went to were not local. In the 1770s, the local uh, fishing grounds had been fished out as, as to cod. So these men are faring out far to the east of Nova Scotia, which is that green thing hanging down there on the right, where it says Shelburne. Due east of Shelburne is Sable Island and a series of fishing grounds where the fishermen from Manchester or Marblehead or Gloucester or any of the towns along coastal Massachusetts could expect to find vast schools of huge codfish. And this confusing map from the period, from the 18th century, gives you a look at, at that same area without the um, color coordination. But if you can see in the middle, it says Cape Sable. And then to the uh, right, which is the east of Cape Sable, is Roseway Bank, and then La Havre Bank, Sable Bank, and then to the east, not depicted, is the Quero Bank. And so none of these actually constitute parts of the Grand Bank of Newfoundland, which is a later fishery. These smaller but actually immense fishing grounds are as far as the men from Manchester had to go out to find their fish. And when they got out there, um, they were, of course, prey to all kinds of weather. It was a moment in history where there was literally no communication with the shore if you were out in a vessel. And often you did not see another vessel for the two or three months that you were out. So if you ran into a terrible storm, you would have to look to your own ability as a mariner to survive it. But it was part of the work that they did. And even on a good day like this one, um, this is pretty typical out on the fishing grounds, 900 miles out to sea. This is not atypical weather. And here is a very small schooner of the sort that would have been the largest sailing from Forster's Wharf. And you might be able to see that there are three men here on the port side, and there's probably another three on the starboard side. And these guys are fishing two drop lines at any given moment. The man closest to us in the stern is actually pulling up a codfish. And um, this is how you spend your days and your nights out on the banks once you arrive. There were day shifts and night shifts. The, um, the men essentially were weightlifters. They're constantly pulling in fish that weigh 100 to 120 pounds. And they might be doing that on both lines at the same time, and they're doing it all day long. Here's another look at, uh, at fishing the double drop lines from the rails. The idea of dory fishing was completely foreign and in the future in 1772. 
and to protect their hands doing this very hard and constant work, and it's always wet, of course. Um, there's some interesting things called nippers, and we have them as part of our exhibit. And these were, the nippers were constantly worn by the fishermen um, over their palms to keep from, to keep the lines that they were using from ripping their flesh as they worked these lines all day long. And it's also true that being at sea, even in summertime, was often a pretty chilly experience. So the fishermen had these heavy woolen mittens that they would also use. And again, this is part of our exhibit, and these are the real deal. These came from down from Nova Scotia to us. So as they're pulling in the fish, they're stopping frequently and uh, cleaning the fish. And it takes three men to do it right, there is a man off to the right who is taking off the head and opening up the entrails. The guy in the middle is getting rid of the guts overboard. And those nine seagulls are actually 900 if you've ever been out fishing. But um, artistic license. He's also going to toss the cod livers into that basket there because cod liver oil is a very important medicine and that's going to come home. And the man over at the left is the splitter and he's got his own kind of knife. And he's taking out the spine and a lot of the bones. So, so this is what fishermen have to do when they're out there on the fishing grounds as well, is clean these fish they flop open into large triangular shapes and they're gonna be thrown down the hold to a lucky guy called the Salter who has um, a deluge of giant codfish falling on him all day and all night. And he is going to lay those fillets out on skin side down and pave them over with salt to preserve them because they're gonna be out there for two or three months Many voyages are going to last two or three months at a time, and all that fish that has been so hard for, fought for has to be preserved. And so it's the salter's job to make sure that it is preserved with the salt that they've brought with them. <clears throat> so once they make it home, a new set of people gets to work. These are the shoremen. The fishermen are done with their work, and the shoremen begin and they begin the process of what we call curing fish. So all along the waterfront of Old Manchester, you would have seen fish yards. And in those fish yards, there would have been 60 or 70 men and little boys constantly buzzing around doing, doing this process of curing a fish. And how it's done is to take the fillets and lay them out on these wooden racks called flakes, sometimes called fish fences. But whatever, whatever you call them, the idea is you pray to God that you're going to have three weeks of sunshine and wind. And if that happens, you might be able to get a really good cure on the codfish, which will over those three weeks, go from being a very wet, meaty, fleshy, former critter to, to drying out to the point of desiccation, where it's, it's literally as stiff as a board, and it has compressed into something very different from a codfish. It's now a foodstuff that can be transported overseas. So these men are constantly busy. They are supposed to flip over a fillet um, every hour of the day to get uh, even amounts of sun and wind on the fillets. They're fighting off seagulls and varmints. And um, the, every single one of these men, in addition to um, their, their duties of going up and down the flakes. And you have to imagine acres of flakes and tons of fillets because that's how it works. 
Um, every, every one of them also has specialized jobs that relate to the landing of the fish. We're going to look at that just a little bit here. So here's a schooner off to the right. The last thing that the fishermen have to do is dump about 30 tons of salt codfish over the rail to somebody in a dinghy, and he is going to paddle ashore and bring his share of the fish onto the beach where, as you can see, he's being met by a horse and cart. And the cart only has a capacity of about 300 pounds. So tons and tons of fish are coming out of these schooners, but they're actually going up into the fish yards in little lots of, of about 300 pounds. And there's a reason for that. So in order to turn these fish into this wonderful thing that can be transported, a fillet. And here you see um, a couple of uh, salt codfish that I've been curing on our uh, fish flake to the right and to the left in comparison to the size of a mature codfish that used to come ashore in the 1770s. In order to get there, these carts are coming ashore and dumping their small loads of 300 pounds of codfish into that tub. And that is a tub of fresh water. So it rinses out the salt that's been building up sometimes for months on board these vessels. And now, now the, um, the fillet is ready to be brought up onto the flakes. If it were not for the washout process with fresh water, the codfish would just burn in the sun. So there's a chemical process here, and it's really important to find the right balance between salt and lack of salt. And that little uh, seemingly small washout tub that you see that would accommodate 300 pounds of this fish is the real deal. It's, it is perhaps 200 years old. And it's one of the things that came out of the fish yards of Nova Scotia, which were the same as the fish yards here in Massachusetts. And, and we have it today. And in the background, you see um, a, one of our fish flakes with a couple of reproduction fish fillets. So as I say, um, codfish was cured in vast quantities. It's almost inconceivable to us. Almost all of the beautiful waterfront these days was actually a working space filled with stinking, curing codfish. And this is something that went on for 200 years, for generations, here in Manchester and all up and down the coast. This happens to be a look at old Gloucester uh, back in the days before refrigeration. OK. So let us say that um, we've done our best to cure a great deal of codfish that has come ashore here in Manchester. But alas, the weather has been lousy, and we didn't do such a great cure. Still, the fish is good enough to transport and sell, but it's probably got some bad spots on it, both of burning from salt and um, some, some spots where it has begun to rot. So there is a market for that. In fact, this is the largest quantity of fish. A perfect cure is hard to come by. So this kind of cod was known as refuse fish. And the merchant vessels from Marblehead and Boston and Salem would be filled up with refuse fish, and the, the merchant vessels were four or five times larger than the fishing schooners. So they could take on uh, a lading of up to 300 tons of cured fish. This was serious business. Um, way more than all the fish that you see in this photograph. At any rate, the second-rate fish, the refuse fish, had a market and here is a merchant of that time with his merchant, this is a Salem merchant with his um, vessel there in the offing. 
and he is at the apex of this fishing economy. And he has agents overseas, including in the Caribbean. And here's a not so great image of a sugar plantation. But the sugar plantations were the destination for most of this refuse fish. In those days in the Caribbean, virtually every European country had a colonized island or two or four or seven. And every single one of those islands was dedicated to one thing, and that is to the growing of sugar cane and its processing into sugar, molasses, and rum. In order to do that, the sugar planters needed hundreds and thousands of enslaved people to do the work for them in the always summertime of the Caribbean. And from the northern shores of South America up to Cuba, that is entirely what was going on in this part of the world. It wasn't all British by any means. It was French, it was Spanish, it was Dutch, it was Danish, it was Swedish. Everyone had a piece of this action because sugar was the most expensive commodity in the world in those days. And if you could survive the climate, you, you could become very wealthy living off the work of your enslaved people. Here they are with their hose digging holes for a new crop of sugarcane. And there they are taking a rest break. So the important thing about salt codfish in those days, the second rate stuff, the refuse fish, is none of these planters raised crops to feed their people because they knew that they could depend on endless quantities of second-rate salt codfish coming from places like Manchester to feed their enslaved workers. And that is what went on in the Caribbean for more than 200 years. As they uh, processed the sugar, they would form it into loaves that looked like artillery projectiles there to the right. And it would be white sugar, it would be brown sugar, and a byproduct of the creation of these loaves was molasses. That's what you would find at the bottom of a vat. And the molasses was actually more valuable to our merchants than the sugar was. So here comes 300 tons of fish from a, on a merchant vessel coming from Marblehead. And the Marblehead merchant is hoping for a return of at least 200 tons of molasses. The molasses would be put into big barrels and rolled down onto the beach, as you see here, and loaded into these uh, small skiffs that were just designed to carry a barrel out to the uh, waiting vessel. So there's two men there in the water who've, got, who've tipped the skiff up on its ends, and they're waiting for that barrel to come down those two planks. The kind of work we don't think about, but that was constantly taking place in order to get home this stuff. And it wasn't, it wasn't to make cookies, folks. It, it, was, it was the stuff of immense wealth because these hundreds of tons of molasses that would come back would be turned into thousands of gallons of rum. And right here in Salem, 
and in Marblehead and in Boston, there were literally altogether dozens of rum distilleries turning that black stuff into expensive brown liquid. And so it all, it all begins with some Manchester guys out there catching a big fat codfish and a merchant hoping to turn that fish into a case of rum bottles um, and selling it throughout New England, an extremely alcoholic part of the world in those days. Okay, so there's another market. If you cured the fish perfectly, there was another market waiting for you. And some of you may recognize this as Bilbao, one of the Spanish ports, the leading port of uh, Basque Spain. All through Spain and Portugal, there were uh, merchants and ports waiting for this fish to arrive. And they had been waiting for it for the past 130, 140 years. Always a dependable supply of this salt codfish coming from Massachusetts. And this is the best quality of salt cod. Families like the Garda Keys, this is a unfortunately damaged portrait. But it is of Diego de Gardaqui, one of the a great merchants of his time in a great merchant house that had traded and would trade with Americans right up to the time of the revolution. And by 1772, Gardaqui was trading with Richard Derby and Jeremiah Lee in Marblehead, and it changed up the nature of the exports from Spain um, so that what was really being shipped under a layer of salt was a great deal of munitions for a war that these guys were planning to bring against the British. At any rate, in those days, Bilbao and all of the big ports of Spain and Portugal had a cuisine based on the salt codfish. Uh, maybe some of you have had some bacalao, and it's still there in, in these seaports. And there are still some pretty large fillets that, um, that are being turned into food. And I should say, even though the codfish dried out perfectly and, and became desiccated, it just had to be cut up a bit on the other end and uh, dumped into a pot of boiling water, and it would turn back into flesh and, and um, be very good eating. The, the Spanish merchants, particularly Bilbao merchants, were not dealing in fish to feed the local population. So here's, here's a look at Bilbao, and you see the highlands above Bilbao, and the great, great, great majority of these hundreds of tons of fish that are constantly coming into these ports are going to go up into those highlands where they will be met by huge caravans with giant wagons that are going to go trundling off across the tablelands of Spain, through southern France, and into northern Italy, selling the fish of Massachusetts as they go. It is the only high protein, uh, distributable type of food in the world, and it fits perfectly into Southern Catholic Europe in terms of its foodways. And so those foodways today are still observed in the various types of uh, bacalao. So there's an inexhaustible desire for codfish, but what do we get back? This is obviously a photograph, but it might well be a look at a Spanish seaport in those days. And um, what we get back in trade for our quite necessary salt codfish from the Spanish would be foremost varieties of wine, port wine and all kinds of sweet wine. We don't have any wine in America. So some people like to drink wine. And here it comes back from Spain. The other thing that's coming back in exchange for fish is the salt that is necessary to keep the fishery going. And that salt is made along the shore 
in Spain. Spain also has fruit that we don't have, particularly in season. So there's a lot of fruit coming back. And most important, Spain has gold and silver. And so we here in Massachusetts don't really have currency. What we're recycling is the gold and silver that comes from Spain. So this is a, um, a critically important trade. And without belaboring it, I will say that um, the, Brit the British Navigation Acts of the 1730s had allowed untrammeled trade between American ports and Spain and Portugal for salt so that the fishery could be perpetuated. They had never contemplated that we would be trading for wine and fruit and specie. So all of that is outside of the um, imperial system and it is what people in London will eventually call illicit trade and it's what we here in America will call um, the only way to make a profit. <laughs> so there's going to be a moment where those uh, two divergent opinions are going to come together and it will be a few, just a couple of years after 1772. So now we've seen a look at the business that this town was engaged in, in a small way. Remember, it's a very small town, but it was engaged in a much larger, real, for all intents and purposes, a half-world economy that it contributed to. Um, as we look at the town of Manchester in those days, as I say, it was very small. Um, it had uh, four distinct villages. It was a town of villages. This is not a map from 1772. I've adapted a map from actually 100 years later. But uh, Manchester Center, the, the village itself, down what is now considered downtown, was one of four villages. Manchester was scattered on the west. West Manchester was the village of Newport, and it was known as Newport. And then there was the middle section, as they called it. And then there was a, a, a town up around Forest Street, North Yarmouth. And then out on the um, east side towards Gloucester, of course, a, a distinct village of Kettle Cove. So although there were only 900 people, they were scattered into four different villages and kind of identified in terms of their village. It's also kind of interesting to think that as, as historic and old as Manchester is, the vibration that it gives off, there's almost nothing left from the 1770s in Manchester. There are some scattered houses, but almost everything we look at is a combination of something from a later period with overlay of uh, Greek revival and some Victorian forms. And remember, that harbor didn't exist. So even when we look at a view of Manchester in the 1830s, it's a view of a place that has replaced most of the buildings from the 1770s as progress has been made. But looking back at that moment in the 1770s, um, the families somewhat laughably of the, uh, of the, of the actual 215 taxable households, 28 separate families were headed by people named Lee. And, uh, and the same was true with some, some other of these old families that had settled here a long time ago and never really left and certainly never been replaced. The, uh, the work in these families, the men were at sea or in uh, the fish yards and uh, the women were at home, cooking and cleaning and sewing and raising children. Unlike boys, girls did not have a career. A boy at the age of 13 would have a choice of a trade to enter or could, if he had the right stuff, he could go into the merchant marine in Salem or Marblehead and hope to become a shipmaster. <laughs> 
or more typically, he, he could become a fisherman. But he had some agency in his life, and girls did not. Girls were left behind, they were put into domestic service, and they had to wait until they hit 19 or 20, and, and one of their fisherman boyfriends made them an offer they couldn't refuse. There were all kinds of domestic chores for girls. Manchester was an agricultural town as well as a fishing town. So here we see a young woman gathering eggs. Here we see a couple of little girls gathering apples. Everyone pitched in on the farms. And if you come to the exhibit at the museum, you will see that we have a pretty neat uh, four minute video of 18th century farming methods that uh, we were able to put together from, from a great old National Park Service film. At any rate, somewhat ironically, at just this moment in the 1770s, up in Gloucester, there is a woman who is thinking about this um, life that girls are born into and the lack of opportunity and Judith Sargent Murray has already begun to write essays towards the equality of the sexes. And those essays will not be published until the 1780s. But as early as the 1760s, that's what she was writing and thinking about. And it's interesting that at least one woman in Manchester at that time a woman named Elizabeth Kraft was, in fact, running a store. Her husband had the tavern in town, and she had been given the store to run. So there, there was always the exceptional situation. It's usually a widow um, or somebody bankrolled by a husband, a woman who is able to get into business without any real rights to be there um, and to hold her place. And that's what Judith, Judith Sergeant Murray was thinking about and writing about, is that things needed to change for women. For boys in that world, there were always jobs on the farm. Here is a boy sitting on a plow watching a man with a harrow churning up the ground after it has been plowed. Uh, boys were worked very hard as little fellows. Almost all of the boys went into the fish yards and ran around with uh, buckets and chased away seagulls and um, had a pretty tough working life, even as a little guy. And um, occasionally, along, along these waterfronts, there might have been a way to dodge out of all of that work for just a moment. And I think this is a, a Winslow Homer watercolor. It's such a, a great image of one of those kids who finally found a place to hide in a barrel and, and rest for a little while. But most boys were put to work doing something or other all day long. Buckets of clams, that's a typical fishing schooner behind them. And at the age of 14, those kids are gonna go out to sea. And let me say that the death rate for fishermen, as for merchant mariners, was horrific. Much worse than any war that we ever had, and in, in some years it was as much as 10% uh, of the mariners. So they constantly had to bring new, new young kids into the business to uh, replace those who had died. And death came to you at sea, Death came to you at home from the simplest of diseases. Little babies would, would die of infections from teething. There was no germ theory. Um, places like Manchester were subject to small epidemics all the time of simple diseases that would carry off the youngest and the oldest and occasionally dig right into the families and take people out of their lives in a way that death was a, was a huge presence from house to house and, and block to block in this town, as in every other town,
in Massachusetts. Um, many, many of even the most wealthy people like Daniel Edwards of his day did not live to see the age of 50. Um, and the consolation in all of this, one hopes, was the church. So as I say, we, we try to interpret all these different parts of life in 1772 in Manchester, and I'm just touching on a, a few of them, but, but to say that here is a very small town that has never had more than one church. It was founded by zealous Puritans who wanted to live an extreme religious life, a Protestant religious life, uh, in, in the way that they felt was going to get them the immortality of their souls. And that church stayed in place as the one church in this town for decade after decade and generation after generation. This is what the actual meeting house looked like in 1772. It's, it stood just a, a little ways from where the Congregational Church stands today. And in 1772, it had a minister named Benjamin Toppin, a Harvard-trained minister who'd been in the pulpit for 26 years at that point. And this is not he, but maybe a friend of his. <laughs> he had to come up with two sermons every Sunday, and um, most people had to struggle through pretty um, wretched hymn singing. There were no organs or beautiful music uh, in, into the 1760s, and um, that all began to change by the time that we were speaking of, 1772. And Benjamin Toppin was a beloved pastor in this town. He'd had, he'd had his few encounters with the evangelicals out at crazy places like what is now Essex, for example, as you can well imagine. Uh, but, but he'd weathered all of those storms. Unfortunately, there was no, there's no portrait of him, but he was greatly admired by his fellow pastors. And when he did die in 1790, um, the, it was a, a turning point moment for this town that he had guided all through the 18th century. And it, it is interesting, a little morbid, but interesting to think about his presence because to an extent there is still a monument to him and it is his own gravestone, which is a portrait gravestone. So though we have no painted portrait of him, there was an effort made to create his facial features here on the gravestone that you see. Benjamin Toppin lived in a house on School Street. It survived for a long time, uh, long, long enough to be photographed uh, many a time. It was one of the many buildings in Manchester that could have survived, but simply didn't survive from the 1770s into our modern period. Um, but it is, it is something to think of a man who becomes pastor in a town and never leaves and stays here in the one church for everyone and gives everyone probably close to equal spiritual guidance and, and hope for the future in a, uh, a time where there's good reason to, to deal with grief and, and early death and sudden disappearances and uh, to think that Manchester was fortunate enough to have this man, uh, a native of Newbury, come to this town, settle here, and found a family that would, uh, would be one of the important families for many generations after his passing. And, and the role that he had in guiding these people through the very difficult lives that they lived on the sea and, and here at home on the shore, it, it's something that I find really interesting that in this very moment, there are people who start to show up in church with bass viols and violins and beautiful music, 
starts to become part of the worship service and part of the spirit of that sanctuary. Um, and, and that music is not English, it's not European, it's beginning to be composed by people like William Billings, a Massachusetts man, and it is finding its way into the churches just as Manchester and the rest of Massachusetts are about to face this climactic moment where they will be separating from this empire that they've been part of for 150 years and what will endure on the other side of that war in, in Manchester will be two really important things. The salt cod fishery, which the men can return to to make their livings, and the church presided over by Benjamin Totten, the man who lived in this red house. So in, in closing, we'll take a look at this fish yard where people never stopped working for 200 years. And let us take another look at Samuel Forster's rediscovered wharf and again, um, hold on to your seats because we're going to be up high and we will be listening to one of those pieces of music that had entered into the worship service presided over by Toppen back in the early 1770s in your town. So I'll just conclude by saying Toppen is gone, the church is still here, the salt cod fishery is gone, but Manchester retains its relationship as ever to the sea. Thank you for your attention.